Hello, welcome to the Donahue Group. Glad you could join us for a half an hour of interesting conversation. I just realized uh, as we were taping our other episode that I forgot to introduce my fellow group members and Don't do a, it twice. a tragic sin. Yeah. So in any event, I am going to introduce former State Senator Cal Potter, um, Professor of Mathematics Tom Pineski, Social work person for the <laughs> for the Sheboygan area school district. <laughs> it Curriculum has, and assessment specialist in social studies for the Sheboygan area school district. Thank you. And a member of the faculty at Sheboygan South High School. Very good. Thank you. Me, I'm just a adjunct professor, University of Wisconsin Green Bay. <laughs> Very good. Oh, that's it. It's surely there's more on your yes, curriculum vitae yeah, that you that's, care to those share are the with highlights. us. Those, those are, the, are highlights. the highlights. All right, we should probably ha do this once a taping is just highlight one member. You know, just well, never mind. I run far afield here. I'm Mary Lynn Donahue, and happy that you're here with us we're talking about state issues that might just segue a little bit into. I want to know who Tom Pineski's favorite Republican candidate for president is. But hang on to it. Hang on. I'm giving you a Who are you looking at me for? <laughs> I'm giving you a half an hour to think okay, about it. And you, want me to, <laughs> you want me to single you? Oprah's endorsed somebody. Yeah, knows you know, I was going to say, there could be candidates entering. And go, well, right, that's like right. Anything. I mean, we could have somebody coming through the door here. You just never know. Okay, um, uh, on the uh, state level, we still don't have a budget. No, we don't. And then it's beginning to become something of an issue for mm -hmm. all of those uh, people who depend on the state budget, including school districts and municipalities. And, and students who want and students financial aid. And who, just on and on. Interestingly enough, the Wisconsin Democracy Campaign has pointed out that in the first six months of 2007, whilst all of our budget bickering has been going on, legislators and the governor have raised $2.05 million in what they term extravagant golf outings and so forth. It's been just a great time to be a legislator when the budget is uh, in, in, in its various birthing throes. I think it stinks. Cal, what do you think? I think it stinks, very much stinks. I think that... I mean, uh, I'm pretty calm and I always no, appreciate your well, the direct... <laughs> I'm a member of Common Cause and Jay Hecht, who's a friend of mine, um, his executive director does post regularly on their website the fundraisers that are coming up and it's just weekly there's a list of all these different uh, legislators and people who are impacted in state government uh, by the budget process having fundraisers and it's really a shakedown at a time when people are, are holding their breath and crossing their fingers that whatever they have in the budget uh, or whatever they want to get in the budget through the conference committee uh, is they're successful in doing so and so it's the shakedown time to get uh, monies from those this, and you know Jay Hecht and Common Cause would say well this is the bidding time the high bidder gets the victory gets something in the budget uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that mm -hmm. and I think it's a sad indictment uh, on the political process because we just went through the scandal where we ended up with some legislators in jail and others who lost the election that there doesn't seem to be any shame here <laughs> that you would think they would at least knock it off, you know, say, no we learned. haven't done anything legislatively to present, prevent uh, budget uh, raising or fundraising during budgets or campaign financing or anything of substance in that area. Um, so they think that at least they would watch what they were doing, but it doesn't seem to have changed anything. And that's really sad. And maybe it, it shows that politicians have internalized that people don't pay a heck of a lot of attention to people in government and they can get away with this type of behavior because there's no repercussion. And maybe there's, maybe there's some truth to that. Maybe we've got people so, politicians are so jaded and people have such a poor attitude towards politics and politicians that no matter what they do, it doesn't surprise them. And so they continue to do these dumb things that are not uh, something that they should be doing. I don't know what it takes. Yeah, um, I, know I mean, to me, and, and I, I believe a number of states have legislated that there can be no fundraising during the budget debate time. Now, that leaves a whole lot of other time, mm -hmm. uh, at least when you don't have a, a government that can't apparently get to a, its budget. Um, but uh, to me, that's, that's easy. You can't have fundraisers. You can't be raising money. It's like the United Way. 
nonprofit organizations that get money from the United Way generally don't fundraise during the United Way campaign. Mm -hmm. And um, everybody accepts that, and it's a pretty rational and logical thing to do. And I, 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 I am kind of flabbergasted that, that no, I'm not. <laughs> I, I'm as jaded as I, yeah. Why would I be surprised? Why would any of us be surprised? But jaded as the chairs we sit in. That, that, that's the case. Uh, you know, what concerns me about, you know, beyond the, we've talked about this on and off throughout the years we've been sitting here, uh, what, you know, look, the appearance of, even the appearance of corruption, which I think really makes it difficult for people to uh, respect the legislative processes. Clearly, somewhere down the line, both sides are going to have to compromise, and I think that's difficult enough given different constituencies having different views of government services and what they consider appropriate levels of taxation. I think you layer onto that the fact that on both sides, and I, count, you know, I speak as a member, compulsory in some sense, a member of WEAC, who spends a gob load of money, I'm sure, paying people to make sure that they don't give on state funding of the two-thirds formula. I think it's really hard to get compromised when you're locked in by campaign contributions. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't know how you get out of that straitjacket. I mean, yeah. it comes I don't to know the why point. Why they want to be in that straitjacket? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, and, and now we have, as we were talking just before we went on the air, a proposal, a stunning proposal. I forget the gentleman, the representative's name, who wants to actually have the state lawmakers turn over the decision of the budget to a binding neutral arbitrator. I mean, James Madison's got to be rolling over in his grave right about now someplace saying we have a, a group of legislators who are can't paid, are paid to find a, some yeah. kind of common ground and they can't, they're actually going to abdicate it to uh, a, a neutral party. Now, of course, they still would have to constitutionally, they still would, I mean, state constitutionally, they still would have to vote on that package. It would be interesting to see how many people would actually honor the arbitrator's decision once they actually saw it, if it ever came to that. But still, I mean, that just speaks volumes as to how dysfunctional state government's sure. gotten. I think and part the of bind it, they're in. That's why that yeah. person's probably yeah. saying that. They don't want to tick off manufacturers and commerce or WEAC exactly. or whatever other constituency that might be losing out through the vigorous compromise process. That needs to take place because you have a very conservative assembly and a little bit more liberal Senate, and it's going to be difficult to split the baby on a lot of these issues. Mm -hmm. And it's not going to, a lot of people aren't going to be happy when the compromises come I mean, down. Don't we talk about the health of the system when you have two parties, and so there is that process of debate and compromise, and, and, and you don't have one party, as we had from 2000 to 2006 uh, nationally, just able to do whatever it wants to do. There are no checks and balances. But now we're in a position where the legislators don't remember what it is to compromise. They don't understand that that's part of the process that they live the pandering lives that uh, on these sound bites and so forth. Well, get real. I can't. Boy, can't I'm. Be pure. I'm kind of being Cal Potter today, just kind of all charged up about it. But it, it is disturbing to me sure. that the the whole legislative process on every level just seems more and more corrupt. And I think part of the state pro challenge too. You know, you talk about the lack of public outrage is. You know, on a national level, as outrageous as that is, at least there is a certain national media that sort of at least pays somewhat attention to that. But when you get to the state level, when most people looking at their evening news on channel, you know, Milwaukee affiliates or Green Bay affiliates in the case of Sheboygan, when was the last time you actually saw any, any kind of sort of meaningful discussion of what's going on in the state legislature on the 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock yeah. news? It's all body bag journalism, bleeds it leads, and I, you know, I don't think I've seen on, and I kind of bounce around the different channels uh, at 10 o'clock and sometimes at 9, I don't see any discussion of the state uh, budget. Mm -hmm. I mean, maybe 15 seconds, 30 seconds, we're on, the, we're on to the, you know, we found a body floating in the river. Uh, and, or how's Britney Spears doing? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, and, and, and so I don't, I, and unless you really read the Milwaukee Journal Sentinel when they have an expose from time to time, I mean, if you listen to talk radio, I mean, it, and on the Sheboygan level, it's all the national right-wing um, noise machine, and and uh, or and and wh where would you get that state news? I mean, WTMJ isn't particularly speaking about those issues in a in a you know, in an informed manner where you see both sides of the debate. I, I think it's hard for people to get information mm -hmm. beyond that. We can't get a budget, and now you could see what the game is being played now is that now the governor 
there's this little kabuki dance going on now, even though the governor's no longer in the state at the moment, is we're going to roll out every couple of days the implications of no budget. A couple of mm -hmm. days ago, uh, it was, well, you know, Medicare is going to be played with. And then the Republicans you know, respond, well, okay, now it's scare tactics. Uh, and now, you know, there'll be, well, student scholarships, it was, I think was brought up last week, and they're being hung up on the university level. And so there's this sort of, and, and so I'm sympathetic to letting people know what the, dis, what the consequences are, but you had Jesse, Jessica Doyle at South High School today for a half hour uh, promising kids a free public uh, education, a college education if they keep a B average in a program that's not even funded yet. And I find that you know, I understand the politics of that. Let's promise all the kiddies something, and then the Republicans look like they put coal in their stocking if it doesn't happen. But you're already committing even more, and I think it happens to be not a bad idea, but you can't promise people benefits before you even have a budget. So I got a feeling, well, somewhere along the way, somebody's gonna have to swallow hard, I think, on the governor's side and say, well, maybe that project's gotta put, be put back in the, back in the bag where it belongs, so we can't even agree on current state spending plus additional state spending. Didn't, uh, just going back, and I, we're spending a lot of time on this, but um, when really important. Gingrich and Clinton basically shut things down in when? 2002? No, it wasn't 2000, no, it was, it was 1995 or I mean, I'm 6. Right. I'm sorry. Yes. I was 95 or 90. It was after the uh, House, so it would be 95, probably in the 94 budget cycle. Voters got really mad, as I remember. And I think that was the end of the Republican juggernaut, uh, the contract uh, on or with America, depending on your perspective. And um, maybe well, there will more be of that. There's a consequence there. I remember my wife and I were in. We were in. Um, There's more of a the, visual consequence that plays Canyon out better on television. That day, and the, the, a lot of things were closed because mm -hmm. the, the personnel weren't paid, and so they were home. Whereas in the state of Wisconsin, the budget continues at last year's level. So, you know, the prison guards are working, everybody is yeah, still. Yeah. 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 yeah, and so you don't have any crisis other than the fact that, you know, something like student additional commitments of student scholarship yeah. for this year are not paid. Right. So that's one of the problems that I think really got Gingrich in a, in, a, in a box. He didn't realize that people wanted these things to continue and operate, and when they weren't, they knew who stopped the budget, and that was Gingrich and not the president. Well, right. and, and, you know, he went to the mat with a guy who was really pretty good at using yeah, television. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And the presidency, <laughs> the presidency well played. Gingrich is, is the presidency good, but Clinton's well pretty good. He's but, pretty good. But you're right, you know, it's not going to be uh, the visuals you'd see on television about schools shutting down and kids sitting at home, you know, kids, cr you know, parents crying because they can't send their kids to school. Or the you state don't get your social security check. And, you know, yeah, it's, it's, yeah. it's hard for the media to visually show people what that means, because that's all the media is interested in on television is what's visually, I mean, we got helicopters flying around just to watch a press conference in Sheboygan. I mean, um, <laughs> I mean, we were, uh, beginning of the school year, there was a, a break-in over at Cleveland, and we had Green Bay and Milwaukee media. We were just crawling with Green Bay and Milwaukee media. I it was think Sheboygan a, has become. It was just yeah. a simple, it was just a simple break-in, and it wasn't like there was a hostage situation or anything. It was just a bunch of kids who broke into us, into the school the day before. And it, it, it's just that it's visual. You can go and look at a broken window and you know, fly your bubble-headed bleach blonde in front of the room. Here it is, a broken window. I'm pretty, you know, I just don't. <laughs> You're pretty cynical. Right? I'm, yeah. I'm, pretty jaded yeah, about the, yeah, I'm pretty yeah, jaded yeah, about the yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, media. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I concur, that's what it is. Well, yeah. and Sheboygan just now just has this, apparently there's a, an Appleton radio station that has a feature every day like what's happening in Sheboygan. <laughs> Well, we are a good community. There's no doubt about it. Well, I think yeah. I think people are pretty good at use it. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> you can't ground it, so you got to fly it someplace, evidently. And you know, you only could do traffic reports at a certain time of the day. Well, we got lots of press releases about this, that, and the other thing. But uh, in any event, but but I, I just don't. I don't. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out because eventually, when push comes, I mean, you're going to have to have a budget, and yeah. people are going to have to people are going to have to compromise and. What will drive it's, it, I think, will be the property tax bills that mm -hmm, have to be exactly. that have to be published, and so school right. aids and shared revenues and right. transportation aids need yeah. to be uh, finalized, and mm -hmm. so that means November probably at the latest. Right, we are an orderly society after all, as we should be. Let's talk about the order in the Supreme Court. Um, Annette Ziegler um, was uh, your the, favorite justice. Hey, 
right? Well. She's an attorney. She has to watch out. Yeah. <laughs> she okay. made me argue a case once. Before. Yeah. <laughs> oh, <laughs> uh, a little conflict of interest. We actually do have Supreme Court justices who have to recuse themselves from any number of disciplinary matters because they get campaign contributions from people. And uh, in, the, um, uh, uh, in these matters, uh, ju the justices can't vote, and we may actually get a, a po in a point in time when they'll be so beholding to all their campaign contributors that they won't be able to make decisions. <laughs> we won't have a majority. Yeah. But um, in any event, um, the um, Judicial Commission, which is the first line of, of of uh, discipline for for judges has determined that a reprimand for uh, Justice Ziegler is in in, uh, in order, and um, it is my understanding that the Supreme Court, which will make an, uh, a final decision on that, rather than having the body decide on it, is actually appointing a um, a committee of judges to to ultimately make that decision. I don't know the details, but that certainly seems to be to be um, a reasonable mm -hmm. approach to it, and uh, a cautionary tale for judges who, um, you know, as time goes on and you get many, many cases coming before you, and uh, it appears in Justice Ziegler's circumstances, she knew or should have known that these were fairly large cases that, and her husband could at least arguably have some financial benefit. The, the, but there the are a lot of... Line, they said uh, clearly there was no benefit to, any, to her husband or anything from all these, all the... Uh, right. Yeah, there was no benefit. They argued that, but they basically said that yeah. she should have known better. She should have recused herself. Yeah, so it Even is the a appearance of that. Yeah, exactly. right. So it is a cautionary tale for for judges uh, everywhere. But the headlines that I or the the story that I love today: Supreme Court Justice Annette Ziegler will spend the first six years of her ten-year term on the court working for free. The reason for that is she uh, put in nearly $825,000 of her own money into that campaign. The, she's get, she gets paid $137,400 a year. So the first six years, she's just rec recouping what she spent on the election. And I know, and I have no idea how much Linda Clifford put into her own campaign, but the plain fact of the matter is the, the overall campaign cost 2.2 or $2.7 million, both campaigns together. Um, you have to be rich. Mm -hmm. yeah, I, either her goal to put a lot of money and he'll never re recoup. Yeah. Either that or what many candidates have done over the years is they give the campaign a loan and then after they're elected, they go out and shake down special interest groups to replenish their campaign, who then they get money reimbursed to themselves. And I guess I don't know that that's been made illegal, but that's over the years that has evolved into a, a mechanism for candidates to do those type of things. So mm -hmm. I don't know if she's been put in a position where she says this is an outright gift or she did couch it as a loan. As a loan. I'm right. going to go through this fairly soon because we're going to have another Supreme Court election. Oh, and I, oh, think, right, I right. think that uh, there's already one person who's declared against uh, Lewis Butler, um, and I can't remember who it is, but a conservative person. Butler is certainly considered to be part of the, the more uh, uh, progressive part of the, the Supreme Court, which typically tends to split on 4-3 votes on controversial issues, but you never know. I mean, it's like the U.S. Supreme Court. They can make their decisions on the funniest little bits and pieces that, that you might not normally think would be the deciding reason, and, and so you get various coalitions and so forth as things go on. But um, I guess I'm just, <laughs> I just continue to be staggered by the amount of money yeah. that is involved, and uh, particularly with the court, um, you obviously have to be out there hustling money. The judge or the candidate himself or herself is not doing that because the Code of Judicial Ethics clearly states that Annette Ziegler can't go out and say, gee, Cal, would you give me some money? It's Annette's campaign, Justice Ziegler's campaign that goes out or Linda Clifford's campaign people who go out and do that. But nonetheless, you know why you're contributing or well, you read your own financial statements before they're submitted to the elections board, or in this case, the new new exactly. board. And so you read who gave you what and how much, and you know. So it's, 
they're not naive. They aren't. They aren't. Although we do know that as you look over these financial um, lists, contributors lists for all races, Supreme Court, um, the, the Doyle campaign is a case in point where you have contributors giving to, to both sides mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, hedging their bets. Sure. I mean, talk about <laughs> absolutely just buying a position. I mean, you're not contributing to Doyle because you really think he's the best guy for the job and, you know, the one who can really do it or Ziegler or whatever. So I, again, I am not surprised. I would like to be, but I'm not as to, to how those things play out. So it'll be interesting to see. Um, apparently the Chief Justice has appointed um, uh, Judge Brown from our district uh, court of appeals, who's a, f a very fine judge in my opinion. I, I really respect, well, we have a very good district here. I respect his work a, a lot. And they're gonna put three judges together to make recommendations to the court. So, so it'll be interesting uh, to, see, to see ultimately how that plays out. Hard to say, but uh, in any event. Um, Another uh, matter that is of great interest to me, I grew up basically on Lake Michigan, on 4th Street. <clears throat> we used to go down to the Rocky, the Rocky Beach we called it, it was the Clifton Avenue Beach, which is now closed. My husband grew up literally on the sand, you know, out the back door and you're, you know, in a sand pile. Um, we just took our son, our younger son, up to Northland College in Ashland, which the college about a mile from uh, Schwamigan Bay on on Lake Superior. We learned that Lake Superior has 30 quadrillion gallons of water. I think Lake Michigan's a little smaller than that, but probably has some number of quadrillion gallons of water, um, right after a trillion. I was going to say, I don't even uh, know how much that is. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, National but, debt gets there, I don't know. Yeah. I got a good joke about a Brazilian, but in any event, and how so much that is. So a thousand trillion is a quadrillion. Yeah. Okay. All I know is it comes yeah, after a a lot of water. <laughs> 10 to the 15th or something yeah. like that. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> power. There you go. 10 to the Lake Michigan, 15. in any event, before I get completely <laughs> bamboozled by here, the math. Yeah, by the math here, um, is losing 2.5 billion gallons of water a day, apparently based on some Army Corps of Engineer misengineering in the St. Clair River. That's what I've read. I don't know if that's true or not. Um, it seems to me that politically, the Great Lakes are becoming a, a pretty big issue. Um, Lake Superior is down a foot uh, in the last year, just in the last year. And I understand these cycles tend to come and go, but like warming trends, they're coming on a little more intently and not bouncing back like they used to. Um, is this a, an issue that, that we sitting here in these very comfortable green chairs need to be worried about? Well, I think the scientists are telling us that uh, on the oceans with the melting of the ice because the temperature is warming and you can de debate how fast and how much is human and how much is other factors, but the fact is that the world is warming. Uh, they're giving, what, polar bears 50 years or so um, expect yeah. before extinction and they're saying that many of our coastlines are going to be inundated with water and one of the inland uh, ramifications is going to be the lowering of lake and river levels. Mm -hmm. And so the inland lakes are going to go down because they are still higher than uh, the oceans. And that as the temperature rises, we're having evaporation. So what you're saying is that engineering quirks and problems that drain water inordinately faster are only gonna exacerbate a problem that's not only gonna be one that uh, prevents us with less water for fishing and water for for drinking, but it's also shipping that's mm -hmm. going to be very negatively impacted. And Sheboygan with its leisure boat fishing and Milwaukee with its uh, deep ocean vessels that come in, uh, Chicago, elsewhere, are all going to have a difficult time with uh, lowered lake levels. So yeah, we ought to be concerned about it. It's economic, it's, it's life uh, sustaining, it's many different things to us. And we have taken it for granted and I think too many people are still taking the Cal Thomas viewpoint that somehow man's activity of six and a half billion people, and they're only where 170 years ago, a billion people, is not having any impact on climate. And maybe global warming is a bad title for it, but man's impact on the, on the ecosystem and the climate and the water distribution is becoming very, very more rapid than we thought it was, and we better pay attention to it. Yeah. 
Well, and I think there's a, yeah, there's a recognition among the governors in the Midwest and the Lake, Great Lake region that this is a, an incredible natural resource and asset that needs to be managed. And there's already, you know, sort of there. discussions of, you know, sh being the OPEC of fresh water and yeah. discussions of maybe shipping it to places like Colorado in the southwest where water tables are are not being replenished and wells have to be dug and aquifers are becoming less and less filled with water simply because of the climate changes and because you're sticking millions and millions of retirees you know, in these areas that really can't support a typical American lifestyle. And so there's some discussion, I know the governor of Michigan won a federal uh, court case yes. where absent congression, because Congress refuses or is incapable of doing anything about this or reaching some sort of covenant. So she went off and started to talk about how we're going to manage uh, the, the Lake Michigan, in her case, in Lake Huron, I think, um, and uh, Lake Superior. And she's inviting the other governors to take part in that, that process so that this uh, is managed intelligently uh, and, and respectfully so that the economy isn't um, really harmed and people's lifestyles and health aren't harmed. Yeah. And then you add a layer on top of that also, you know, all sorts of invasive, because you opened up sure. the seaway, all sorts of invasive animal and plant life that was never there before that's starting to crowd out that which was indigenous. And there's some real discussion about creating more regulations about ships and when they traverse these areas and cleaning the bottoms to keep certain things out. And there's going to be some expensive costs involved in doing that. Yeah. And I know that manufacturing is fighting some of that, and understandably, but... And then just the conservation of the resource, I guess, after every large rain when a huge amount of untreated sewage is dis discharged into Lake Michigan, scientifically with the thought that the lake can absorb it and so forth, but if you want to go down to the lake and swim, well, you better take your E. coli tester along with you to make sure that the water is not contaminated. It just seems to be a mismanagement of of a huge resource. I'm always pleased to say to people, I live a block from the biggest lake uh, in the United States, the biggest mm -hmm. freshwater lake uh, in the United States. And uh, so not to take care of it seems to be kind of silly. We've got one, well, one minute, minute left. I know, I always, I always think about the, uh, every other summer or something, there's major floods. So water just, and Texas just recently, and that whole southwestern area has just been mm -hmm. flooded for weeks and weeks. So where's the big, you know, cry for water? I mean, they're just inundated. They had too much. And then Missouri usually floods, and the Mississippi changes its course every sure. 10 years or something mm -hmm. because of floods. So nature, yeah. it does provide, but sometimes in excess. Since you're talking, we only have a few seconds left. Who's my Here it candidate? Is. Who's for... your candidate? Oh. I don't have one. I'll tell oh. you. Oh. Oh. I'll tell you it was it was initially Mitt Romney. Okay. But I'm having second thoughts. I think there may be a better candidate. I loved Rudy Giuliani's Must be comment. Fred no, <laughs> we got to wrap Fred. up. It's not Fred. <laughs> we'll, we'll keep talking about this. Thanks for joining us.